So when you're building a GraphQL server, there is a common issue that comes up called the n plus 1 problem. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at it and how you can solve it. So this problem usually comes up when you have a relationship in your schema and you try fetching the data for that. So for example here, I have a schema with two types, type of book and type author. Now you notice on my type book, I have a field here and the author field actually is of the type author. And so a lot of times the book and the author are stored in two different database tables or they may be stored in two different databases altogether. And so you may fetch them in different ways. And so when I fetch books here, the query, I'm fetching multiple books and I also may need to fetch the author for the books. So depending on how I set up and resolve the data for this, I can have or run into the n plus one problem. And I wanted to make a quick note here, I'm using the Apollo syntax to actually create my schema, but it doesn't matter if I choose to use something else like type GraphQL to create the actual schema. Usually the problem stems from the relationship itself when I'm fetching multiple books and I also need to fetch other relationships, for example, the author. So let's take a look at how I resolve the data for this relationship. So down here I have the books query and you'll notice I am using next to fetch the books. Now this doesn't really matter if you're using SQL or Mongo. All that really matters is we're doing some kind of request to get the books. And you'll notice we are not getting the authors here. So we fetch the books and we return them here. And then we actually take use of a field resolver here to load in the author. And so we have the book field or book type, and inside of that we resolve the author field with this function. Now inside of here, what we're doing is we take the parent, which is gonna be a book, and we get the author ID, and we fetch the author based on that. And if we go over to GraphQL Playground and run the query, this does work. It will fetch the correct data. So I'm gonna just come over here and I'm going to run this, and it looks like I already had it run anyway. But you'll notice I am fetching the ID title for books and I'm also fetching the ID and name for author and I get exactly that. But the problem is, is if I log the commands that were run or the SQL that were run or the number of database requests that happened, I'm gonna be doing quite a few. So if I open up my log here, I'm just going to clear it and run it again. You'll notice what happens is we do a single SQL query to fetch the books. And then for each book, we fetch the author. So you'll notice it created five SQL requests because I have five books. Now, if I were to limit this to 10 books, give this a save, and I were to rerun this, you'll notice we fetch the books, and then we fetch the users, and now we have 10 SQL requests. And so this is why it's called the n plus one problem, because for every book, n is the number of books, that is the number of SQL requests or database requests we are making. So as we fetch more data, our query gets extremely slow. And one thing I want you to note about this, this only happens when we fetch the author field right here. Because of how GraphQL works, the field resolver or the author resolver only runs when we fetch that field. So for example, I can remove that and just fetch books with the ID and title. So now if I clear my log over here and I run this, I fetch just the books and we only run a single SQL query here to fetch it. So one of the most popular ways to fix this problem is to use a tool called Data Loader. So we're gonna look at that first. Now we're gonna look at the resolver to start off with. So notice that the book resolver looks exactly the same we are fetching the books. But what changes is our field resolver right here. So we are getting access to the context, the GraphQL context, and we're accessing this thing called an author loader, and we call dot load passing in the author ID. And so the whole idea behind data loader is we take all the author IDs, we batch them together, and instead of making a query for every single book, we batch them together, make a single request, uh, and fetch all of the author IDs or all the users at once. So this is what you do in your resolver. To actually batch and make that batched request, what we do is we create a author loader. And so it looks something like this. 
So here's our author loader that we are creating and we're passing in our context. And when we have a function that we're passing into the context here with Apollo server, what's actually gonna happen is a new data loader is created every single request. So data loader not only batches things, but it caches things. Now, usually you only want the cache to happen per request. That way we're not getting stale data. Okay, in our data loader here, what we do is we pass a function in. And this function is how we handle the batching and how we do a single request. So here we take a uh, parameter called keys. Keys is where we're gonna store or where we're gonna get the array of author IDs. So we take the author IDs and we fetch them. So here you can see I'm saying next.select wherein the ID is one of these keys. And so here with a single database request, I was able to get all the authors. And then here's a, just a little bit of plumbing that you need to do with data loader to return the authors in the correct order. And so if we see this in action now, I'm gonna just restart mine and run the data loader server that I have. I'm gonna clear this here and now we're gonna run it and we're gonna see what happens. So if I run this just with our books query without the author field, same thing happens, we just fetch a single request like this. But now if I say author ID name, we fetch the author here. And if we see in our log what happens, we fetch a single or all of our books and a single query. And then after that, we fetch all of our users or all the authors for the books. And you'll notice here we are fetching uh, five of them. So now if I come back up to my query and let's say I change this to 20, save this, clear the log and rerun it. So even though we have 20 users that we are fetching, we are only doing a single request. And so that is the power of data loader. We have batched it all into a single one. So this is a lot more performant than doing a request per book. Now, one of the great things about data loader is because it is split between two requests, getting the books, getting the users, the books and users don't even have to be in the same database. So for example, maybe I store my books in a Mongo database and I store my users in a SQL database like Postgres. I can do two different requests and I can do a data loader batched request to Postgres and the books I fetch from Mongo. And so you can split things up between different services or different data tiers if you need to. Now there are two things I want you to keep in mind. Now I don't necessarily want to call these cons, but they're not exactly advantages either. So the first thing is we have a single relationship here. If we have more relationships, we need to create a new loader per relationship. So I created a single author loader here. If we have, say, we also want to fetch not only the author, but then that user has a profile and we need to fetch the profile, that would be another data loader that we would create. So you actually create a, a data loader per relationship. So there is a little complexity in creating these data loaders per relationship. The second thing to keep in mind is we're doing two requests, right? We are doing a books and then a user's request. Some of you that are very adept at databases know we can actually fetch all this data in a single request. And so that's what we're gonna look at next. So data loader is one way to solve this problem, but it's not the only way. So let's look at another solution. So I'm calling this the join example because we are doing a database join to fetch all of the data in a single request. Now again, this is only possible if all your data is in the same database. But I would say a lot of times that is where your data is stored in a single place and you can do something like this. So for example, I'm doing next select books and then I'm doing a left join to get the users. Now I have this function here called hydrate. All that does is it maps the request that we have here because the data is gonna come back from the database in a different uh, shape than we want it. So I'm calling hydrate that will just loops through and maps it into the shape that I need it to return. And so you'll notice this is actually a little bit simpler. I didn't have to set up a field resolver. And all I have here is a database request, a single one, and it gets all the data all at once. So let's look at this in action. So I'm gonna run that. Then I'm gonna clear the log, come back over here. We're fetching both the author and the books. You'll see the data looks the same on the right over here. 
but now we have a single database request. So one of the advantages of this is it's going to be faster because we're doing a single request. Now when I say this is faster, a lot of people say sometimes it's faster, but other times it's faster not to do a database join and to do multiple queries. But my main point here isn't how you do the SQL request and that database joins are always faster. My point is we can write a single database request. Maybe this contains a join. Maybe this contains a subquery. Maybe it's a recursive CTE or whatever they're called. But my point is this is going to be faster because it's making one round trip to the database compared to two round trips to the database. But what I have here does have a flaw or a downside. So you'll notice we are always doing a join here. Now if I come back and query, I don't have to always fetch the author. So for example here, I can, might have a query that only needs the ID and title. So I run this and we just get these back, but you'll notice in our log over here, we still do the join. So in this case, we are unnecessarily making our query complex or we're making our query slower by doing a join. So in this case, we are doing more work than we need to to get the data. That is the main downside to this approach. If you don't fetch all the fields, you may be overfetching. In some cases, this may not matter though. It may be a small performance optimization that really doesn't matter to get rid of the left join that you're doing or the extra part that you're doing in every request. Or you may just always need the author. Like some GraphQL queries that I have in my schema, I always need to fetch the relationship. But there is a way where we can get the best of both worlds, where we can do a single request and get all the data we want, like this, when we need the relationship, and when the relationship is not there, we don't have to do the left join. And so that is the next example we're going to take a look at. So in this, what I do is I take advantage of this fourth parameter that GraphQL gives us in our resolver. It's called the info object, and this contains attributes of what the user selected here. So in our GraphQL query, we can actually look at that info object and see if they selected the books and if they selected the author. So I can know when they have selected the author field and when they haven't. So then I can do a conditional join or subquery if I need to. So take a look at this. I made this function called does path exist and it takes a look at the field nodes in the info and then it tells me if this path exists. Did the user select books and then the author? Now I'm not gonna go too much into this function but I'm gonna put the code on GitHub if you wanna check it out. Basically what it does is it recurses through the list of nodes and figures out if the path exists. So I have a value here called should join auth table which actually now I'm looking at it, I'm not sure why I call it an auth table. It really should be called user table. But anyway, I use the next query builder here and I start my query and then I say if should join user table, if I should, I add the left join, otherwise I don't. So this is a really nice place where you can use a query builder and you can conditionally create a query very easily. And then down here, I just await the request. And then again, I'm calling my hydrate to format my books. And so let's see this in action. If I do yarn conditional join, I'm just going to clear this, come over here. I'm going to fetch my author. And you'll notice this has a left join in it and it happens in a single request. And then if I get rid of my author and I run this, you'll notice I have my data back and we do a single request here that does not have the left join. So now we kind of have the best of both worlds. We have a single request and we're getting all the data that that user needs no matter what fields they are selecting. We can even take this a step further if we wanted to and only select the fields that the user wants. So for example here you can see I'm saying select all from books um, but let's say I don't want the title right and I only want the ID of the book. I'm still fetching that from the database so there is levels to the optimization we can do and we can even take this a step further. In my opinion that optimization is not worth it a lot of times and the complexity of actually getting it set up is not really worth the performance gains you're going to get. Now what I will say is this is example of just a single relationship we are fetching so this will only get more complex as you add more relationships in there. So there's going to be some cases where it may be simpler to create data loaders than it is to try to do a single request and join all these things together. 
So when you run into the n plus 1 problem, keep both of these techniques in mind. And I think in a lot of cases, you can just get away with doing a single request like this and not worrying about conditionally joining anything or conditionally creating a query at all. One library that I wanted to mention was JoinMonster because I know at least one person is going to ask about it. I haven't used it in a while, but it is a library that takes the GraphQL query and does the conditional joining that I was talking about automatically for you. But taking a look at it, uh, the commits have been pretty sparse lately and the project kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not really sure if I can recommend using this. You may want to start building kind of your own abstractions over creating data loaders or creating conditional statements yourself. So that is the n plus one problem and the different techniques you can use to solve it. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.